All right. Thank you very much for having me tonight. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, you gave me an opportunity to go back and to perhaps recall and remember uh, many of the things that I had forgotten. Um, I have to tell you that uh, I built this house in Frederick in 2005, 2006, and I started the concept of remoting the station in 2007. All I can tell you is you see it there. <laughs> it was not a good idea. <laughs> Here's what the problem was in 2007. First of all, those of you who may not understand contesting, SO2R stands for Single Operator Two Radios. I was trying to build a contest station, and I was trying to put two stations in, therefore two radios, enough antennas, to operate everything simultaneously in a contest so you could be on two bands at one time. Uh, I have to tell you, the station performed much better than the operator. <laughs> I never was, I never mastered it. It was, it was really terrible. But the idea of remote controlling things that could blow up and explode and burn down the house uh, was very, very scary to me. And I found out that you need internet connections that are actually fast and reliable with no latency. And being in a third world country up there on top of the mountain in Frederick, I first had dial-up, then I had satellite. Satellite is really good and as long as it's email. <laughs> if you're trying to do anything real time, I'm telling you, you can go out for a cup of coffee. And I got so desperate that I got this 14 element Yagi on 800 and some megahertz to try to use the EBBO cellular, which I guess back then was not very fast. I still had high latency. So to tell you the truth, it didn't work. The other problem was this idea of remote switching systems. Uh, the ham radio people had really not developed anything, and the computer people had things that were generic. So in 2011, uh, Comcast discovered the fact that we didn't have any Comcast uh, on our road. Uh, they put it in. And at the same time, Remote Rig, which is a company, I think, in, uh, in Sweden, um, came out with a two black boxes. And it enabled you to have uh, a remote operation without a computer. But uh, basically, without a computer, you're trying to re do a remote operation. You can't switch antennas. But the nice thing about the 706 uh, was that it also had 440 and, and uh, 144 megahertz. Uh, and if you guys ever talked to Bruce W4HI, W4HI uh, did remote ring with the 706, basically uh, copied my system, and he uses it very, very well and uses it with a cellular motor. Uh, this is what it looks like. So this is the, uh, the uh, remote rig box. Here's the remote rig box. This is the remote head from a 706, and this is a 706 radio body. This is equivalent to having this in your trunk and uh, the remote head in the front of your car 50 miles away. <laughs> That's what these two black boxes do. But you can't switch antennas, you can't do rotators, uh, you can't do a lot of things. Oh, uh, of all my grandchildren, Wally was the only one who was interested in uh, operating the radio. And the problem with Wally is he doesn't understand the words reboot the computer, Wally. So here were my concerns. Uh, the, the house in Frederick is, is unoccupied. It's not attended. So there's nobody to reboot anything. And trying to go through a PC, trying to, to do your radio, it has a tendency to not work 100%. And um, that was the reason I, that, that I was attracted to the remote rig. Um, the, antenna, the antenna scheme that I had here was very complex for selecting it. So I was still afraid of, of controlling the amplifiers. Now remember, the internet's working, so at least that part's okay. And everything back then, the amplifiers, the radio, at that time I had Yaesu radios, uh, uh, antenna controllers, you name it, they were all serial ports. I had eight, no, 12 <laughs> serial ports, okay, on the computer. 
My mean time of between failures was probably about four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so that was an Achilles heel. <laughs> Plus the idea of turning around the antennas and, 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 and switching antennas uh, with a generic remote control software, which is basically nothing more than a switch on and off uh, over the internet, was also less than satisfying. So this is what we had to control. There's a lot of stuff here. Uh, this stuff here is pretty normal, the radio, the antenna tune, and the amplifier. Now you're into turning the antennas. I had a four square, which I had to change the direction of. I had uh, Yagi's I had to turn around and select. Then I had, and, and it gets a little complicated because I can't use a band decoder to select the antennas when you have four 40 meter antennas. It's pretty tough to tell them which one you like. <laughs> so uh, it only works real well when you have <clears throat> one favorite antenna per band. I had to reboot the computer from afar. I wanted to be able to turn the power on and off from afar. I wanted to be able to monitor the SWR, and if it reached too high, by the way, when you're operating uh, remotely, I have to tell you, the, the chances of selecting the wrong, wrong antenna every time is about 100%. <laughs> okay, and then I had my station PC, which was 1.7. My remote, remote PCs, are fresh installs of Windows XP, and they're locked down. In other words, they don't do automatic updates anymore. They, they're there, they work, there's no email, there's really no way to get into it too much, I don't think. And I'm a big fan of Team Viewer instead of logging me in for uh, remote desktop. Okay, now 2013, which was just last, last year, uh, Elecraft decided to uh, add a tuner and a 500 watt amplifier to the K3. I had a K3, and I already had the remote rig. And uh, so I sold one of the amplifiers, and I got enough money to buy a tuner, an amplifier, an amplifier. I thought about something else. Oh yeah, the K30. Uh, that is a uh, K3 with uh, no RF in it just all the electronics. Uh, Green Heron, the company that made these controllers and turned the antennas around, came out with something called Green Heron Everywhere Systems. And I can tell you, you can see the ads, you can read about it, and you have no idea what it does. <laughs> it is the most confusing description of anything I've ever seen. And I called him up on the phone, and the guy says, try it, you'll like it, and he was 100% right. Oh, and then, um, uh, I had this idea of this massive switch inside the shack and the coax is going out to every location. Um, and I ran out of coaxes, so I started putting these remote coax switches at the base of one of the towers and also at the four square, which complicated the switching arrangement tremendously. And of course, this dream of SO2R was abandoned, which was very important to do because without that, none of this would have happened. <laughs> okay, so this is the station, and there's, it's, there's two stations here. That's one K3, which is a remote K3. This K3 here is the local K3. The amplifier here is, is on the floor, and that's the, that's the uh, ACOM 2000 controller. But the, again, the amplifier is on the floor, you can't see it. Then this is the 500-watt uh, uh, amplifier aircraft, the antenna tuner, the computer screen that runs this on this side. And these are all the switching arrangements. So let's, let's see if we can make this a little bit bigger. Um, so this is one of the remote control switches to the, to the uh, antenna switch. I mean, the, uh, the remote switch at the base of the tower. This selects uh, antennas for either radio. This is radio, this radio, and this little knob is for this radio over here. Uh, I forget what that does. Um, <laughs> And there's lots of wires and stuff like that. And that's the rotator. Uh, this is the station at home. And, um, uh, and the only difference between these stations is it seems a little bit less wires. <laughs> uh, got some junk here and wires and everything. But other than that, you basically have, uh, this is an extended screen that runs off the laptop. That's a K30, which is a K3 with no, uh, uh, no RF in it. And basically, the little black box, the little remote rig is sitting below the monitor, and that's hooks it up to the uh, to either uh, My father was a photographer, and this is his picture that he took me in my novice station when I was uh, 13 years old. Uh, you can't tell what equipment there is; it, it, it's in the station, but uh, I was able to recreate it. 
So for those of you who are not interested in new radios, but old radios, these are old radios. Uh, that was my Nava station without the BFL. Uh, then I duplicated my AM station. I used to have a Viking Valiant. This is a Viking Ranger. The Valiant was too heavy and too big to fit on the desk. And then I always wanted an S-Line. So that's a KWM2 with the BFO and then uh, the amplifier on the side. And uh, actually, I really didn't want the S5 as much as I wanted that microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the matching microphone. That was the one that was sort of in all the ads uh, for the KWS1. So you promoted all that too? Uh, no. I, the, the problem is, is that this transmitter uh, on 40 meters transmits some free frequencies simultaneously. I don't think it was designed to do that, <laughs> so I didn't remote this. Okay, this is a green heron everywhere system. Essentially what this is, is this is called the base. This is a, uh, this plugs into the uh, computer, uh, USB, and then there's eight switches in here, but this is also a radio built in here that communicates to additional remote switches. So this was, this is an outdoor enclosure, so that's really designed to be hundreds of feet away at the base of the tower. But since all my switching was in the shock, I left it inside the house. So these two things are not wired together. It's connected by radio of some sort. This is the key to the reliability. Remember I talked to you about all those uh, serial ports hanging off of that PC that had four minute uh, MTBF? Well, this little device here is called a port server. And it sells for about 200 bucks on eBay. You can get it for 50. And it's ethernet. And it, plug, and it comes out to four RS-232 ports, real RS-232 ports. This is the most reliable thing I've ever seen for serial, own, serial operation over the internet. Absolutely beautiful. 200 bucks is a little heavy, 50 bucks is a pretty, pretty good price. So are they IP access? Say again? Are, they, are the interfaces accessed with like a, a, a web API? Like, in, a, uh, like how do you control the, the interface? Let me answer that question. Stand by. Okay, good question. It's already answered. Okay, so here's the challenge. Remember the green hair everywhere system with all these little tiger switches? These are switches. These are switches. I gotta make these things go around in order to select my antennas. So this, this is a, the switch at the base of the small tower. The C3 is on top. I have a stepper in the middle. I have a 40 meter dipole hanging off of it and a six meter beam. If you notice here, this says radio A and radio B. This is radio A. And this selects the location of these remote switches. So am I going to collect, select this remote switch at the um, base of the tower? There's another remote switch that's sitting on top of here that goes to the four square. Uh, or do I go directly to the uh, doublet through a uh, four to one balance? If you notice here, that it's possible for both switches to be in, to select the same antenna at the same time, or one would think. Actually, the way this works is, is that the first one that grabs the antenna has it. So if you take the second switch, put it in the same position, you're not going to grab that antenna. So there's absolutely no way to have two radios transmitting into each other. <laughs> um, and so that's a real fabulous uh, device. So here is the RF path. This is the uh, remote K3. Goes into an amplifier. The SWR bridge goes into a tuner. This is that six pack switch, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. And now the switch pack six, this is one of the green heron panels to switch this. Then I go up here and then I have another switch over here another switch over here, so I either go up this way, I can get three or four antennas this way, go up here, three or four antennas this way, or go straight out to where I have my all band double. This is what the six pack looks like. Radio A goes in here, radio B goes in here, and if I switch this to here, it picks up that one. I switch this to here, it'll pick up that one. If I switch both here, they both think they're going there, but in reality, the only one that gets there is the one who gets there first. So that's what a six-pack looks like. So it's essentially two rotary switches with some relays. <clears throat> okay, this is inside that four uh, rotary switch, uh, remote switch device. That, that is a remote coax switch that's at the base of the tower. Uh, I added relays. Oops, I added relays inside of it. 
Because when you really think about it, if I have toggle switches, I, got a to I need four of them. And I gotta select them one at a time. So if I put two on at the same time, it sort of screws it up. So, and I didn't have that many switches in the green herring system. So I figured out a way by adding these relays, I could have one relay which selects odd and even, and the other relay which accepts high or low. So we either got one and three or two and four. And here's the way that looks. Here's the first relay, high and low. This is the second relay, the double pole, double throw, okay, that gives me my odd or even. It's kind of like the old UHF high low on the TV selector, right? I have no idea. Not that old. Not that old. But anyway, by the way, by the way, this same circuit is a circuit that's inside that remote coax switch. When you have a remote coax switch that sends, uh, that basically sends the power down the coax, the way that works is there actually are three relays. One position is no power, one position is plus, the other position is minus, and the fourth position is AC. That's how they get four positions out of basically two wires. Okay, here's what the, the answer to your question. You need a real good router that allows you to port forward so you can have all this IP communication coming from the internet going to the correct device. This is hard to follow here a little bit, but basically this is the remote ring. There's one, two, three, four ports that have to be uh, forwarded. Here, I need another port for the green hair and engineering. I need another port for Telnet, another port for uh, the amplifier, another port for the DigiBoard. That answers your question, okay? Um, uh, this is a, a virtual uh, serial port emulator because I had to do some port uh, emulation. I'll go into what that is. Then I have my DRAPs up here and some Freestar stuff up here. I control my AC power strip here as well. Okay, echo link is in here, and so on. So th this is this is the hard part, figuring this stuff out. Okay, if you're going to do remote control, these are all the things you have to be concerned about. The big one up there is this a static IP address, and uh, I don't pay for a static IP address, but I use a service for static IP called a Dynamic DNS. It's free. So that allows me to actually put a name in my web browser and no matter what my IP is, it basically knows where it is. And the way it knows is that the computer in the shack once in a while will go ahead and ping their server and say, here I am, whatever IP address is, this is, you gotta put this name on it. And it does that periodically. So if the IP, static IP address ever, or the dynamic IP address ever changes, it's going to send it and it's going to update it to what the new thing is. Okay, this is why you use uh, people like uh, Green Heron. You have lots of questions. Very time consuming, okay? And each one of these tests is actually in the shack. You don't test from afar. You test in the shack so you can watch the LED switch around and you can make sure your antenna selection is correct. <clears throat> this is no, nothing more than a list of all those people that can give you uh, static IP addresses. So just put in static IP address in, in Google search and most of these people are probably free. All right, now I told you I have one PC. This is, PC is the one that's it's an old PC. Old PCs work. So this is a PC from the, from the uh, probably from the uh, middle century. Um, uh, two gigabytes, 80 gigabyte drive, uh, a compact or an IBM, and a uh, fresh install of XP, updated, and then locked down. All right, so, so that means that it's never going to change. The operating system is never going to change for me. I know what I got, and I know it works. So these are the connections 
okay, where I connect to the rotor, I connect to the four square switch, the front yard switch, and I connect to the short tower, and I also connect to the six pack. And this is how, uh, uh, it, and, and this is the port that's forwarded from or through the router. This is a picture of the four to one ballon on the all band Dublin. This happens to be the body left over from the 706. One of these days I'm going to sell that radio, but it's sitting there, it's holding up the ballon. <laughs> Uh, this is the picture of the DC, right here. Uh, it's an old compact of some sort, and it serves very nicely, and all it does is run a rotator on one serial port and uh, communicates to the, uh, over USB to the uh, green hair and everywhere. Doesn't touch a radio. No radios go through this PC. Okay, talk about generic switching. This is my attempt in 2007 to generically switch something. So I got a little eight uh, switch, um, uh, eight switches on a USB board, a serial board, I'm sorry, RS-232 serial board, and this is the software. Uh, who can tell uh, what antenna is on and off and where it's going? It's impossible to do this. And when you see what Green Heron uh, did, you'll be very excited. This is what Green Heron did. Um, this is uh, the remote switch at the base of the short tower. This is the remote switch at the base of the four square. This is the six pack that is in the, um, in the shack itself. This is the rotor control. And this is the four square. Short tower, front yard, six pack. I'm going to show the four square. This is a little bit bigger. Look how nice this is. It's got labels and everything. So basically, in this case, notice I do this. When I'm not using the radio, I put it in a position where there's no power to any relays. That's my non-operate standby condition. Why burn up a relay if you don't have to? So if I want to operate remotely, I do here. In other words, I, if I'm going to run to the tri-bander, I collect the remote short tower and I move and I select the tri-bander. That's how I get on the tri-bander. If I want to go to uh, the 160 meter inverted L, I move this up to the front yard remote and I move this up to the inverted L. If I'm local, I have this down here. Now, notice with this concept, it's actually impossible to get those, like in these mechanical days, you could rotate the two switches and end up in the same uh, coax position. You can't do that here. It's, 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 it's all uh, uh, mutually exclusive. Okay, so here's the program. This is for the four square. I have four directions, northeast, southeast, southwest, northwest. I'm only using two switches. Off off gives me northeast. On off gives me southeast. Off on gives me southwest. And on on gives me northwest. So it's very, very clever. And if we go back, when I go to northeast, it lights up here. If I go northwest, it lights up there. Very, very tricky. All right, remember we talked about the AC outlets. AC outlets can be turned on and off through this web browser. This is also internet directly through this to whatever port that uh, power strip is on. And each one of these is a different outlet that controls something different. And notice that everything is off except these. These are my computers. Now, the problem with this web browser concept is that generally in my operation, I just turn everything on or everything off at one time or I reboot the computer. So trying to go through a web browser, point and click, is, takes too much time. So I found a program for control line um, uh, commands. So this is a telnet session. So I can telnet in. And these are preset buttons that do different things. For example, if I want all on, this turns all on, and that's a carriage return. If I want to turn everything off, I'm really only turning off 1 through 19 because 2 through 20 or through 24 are my computers. I never want to turn those off. Okay? 
Then I can uh, uh, reboot um, uh, the green heron system. Uh, uh, I can reboot, um, I'm sorry, these are re rebooting the uh, computers that runs the green heron system or rebooting the station computer. And this is my login stuff. All right, remember we talked about... Uh, they did? Yes. What, what's the manufacturer of your the power strip there, the IP power strip? Uh, APC. It's APC. Okay. APC. It sells for 800 bucks, I got it free. <laughs> uh, you can buy them. There's two kinds of APCs. You've got to be careful when you go to the Amfest. All right, one kind monitors over the internet, but the outlets don't switch. The other kind monitors and switches. You want the one that switches. The guy who sells them, 20 bucks for the ones that don't switch, $40 for the one that eight switch, that does switch, eight outlets. Okay, so it's worth the 40 bucks. All right, some of the software that I was using was old. And if you notice here that the LP100 only uses the COM ports one through eight, and I, was, I needed something that would get me to 18. So I had this program called Virtual Serial Point, a serial port emulator, which allows me to tie COM2 to COM23, and COM1 to COM18. This is nothing more than a little yellow sticky note that tells me where everything is. This is what it looks like in the software. Okay, how everything is tied together. Very, very cool piece of software. Found that from uh, talking to people in the reflector. All right, the fall of 2005. This is uh, not the equipment, not the antennas falling down in 2005. This is the antenna going up <laughs> in 2005. All right, the problem with this stupid tower is that it needs a crane. You cannot carry any antenna up it. And this was putting up two yachts. This was the, um, actually this is the UHF, VHF, Yagi's up here, four Yagi's. The monster, take a little look at it because it's gonna disappear soon. And then this is a two element. This is what it looks like today. This is the base of the tower, and that's the top of the tower. <laughs> uh, nothing but UHF and VHF antennas on here now. VHF antennas fell down because they were big enough? Pardon me? They fell down because they were big enough? Yeah, big enough means they fall down. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, the radio shack is located on top of this garage. Uh, my contribution <coughs> to the mountain house is uh, from here over. Uh, that's all I'm responsible for. The rest of it is my XYL. Uh, this is a picture of the shack. Uh, this is the station, and uh, that happens to be uh, the columns, the equipment there, and then back here is the, uh, <coughs> the, the AM station. This is a picture of the 60-foot tower, the one that works. Uh, and that is a small three-element beam. Uh, it's a C-free antenna, which is two elements on every band. And uh, six-meter beam on top. Uh, basketball court resonates on, uh, on 440 as well. <laughs> and uh, there's some dipole there someplace. Uh, I, I wanted to show you a picture of my four square. I'm glad you see that. That's a great picture of it. It's only 40 meters, or is it 82? Or? 40 meters, four square. I have two 80 meter verticals that are in phase. They're not up yet. Volunteers, this spring will put it up. Uh, this is the power strip. 24 uh, outlets, and it's all. Each one can be turned on and off remotely over the internet. This is the port server that sort of stuck it behind the radio. Um, and uh, RJ45s come out, and I wired it up to uh, RS232 DD9s. Uh, this is the shack at home. Basically, it's my home office. This is where I do work, and this is where I play over here. And uh, yes, I did play all these golf courses. Um, I think I got at least 100 on each, uh, each ball there. <laughs> Uh, this, is a, this is a screenshot here of uh, two, um, uh, this is the screen on this side, the left side, which is a PC, which is the uh, logging program, and then on this screen has all the, uh, this, this big screen here is the, uh, uh, the antenna tuner, this is the amplifier, this is the SWR bridge, and this is all the green hair stuff that you saw. Uh, this is what the uh, SWR bridge looks like and uh, uh, power out, SWR, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is the uh, antenna tuner, tells you the SWR in, the SWR out, and all the settings of C and L. 
Uh, this is the amplifier uh, screen, so you know everything that goes on with the amplifier is one, how much RF power in and out and all that stuff. This, this is the uh, screen that you've seen before, the uh, uh, green hair and switches. <coughs> so if you really wanted to do this, you need all this stuff. So this is the equipment list. What controls the Foursquare? Uh, the uh, Foursquare is controlled by the Green Heron. So it's already built to take digital and... No, 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 it's just two switches. You know, it's relay control. Okay. In the shack, it's a, uh, I didn't see the picture of it, but it's basically a box with a rotary switch. And this is not, and the rotary switch happens to work in PCD, so you know, that's why I could use two lines. It was already it's smart enough to know where to run. Didn't have to worry about it. And this is a key right here from my, from my perspective. Okay, lock down that PC. All right, this is the station saver. This is what makes me sleep at night. I told you that with 100% certainty, I am going to select the wrong antenna, which means the SWR is going to be very hot. This SWR bridge, made by Larry Phipps, has a circuit here that interrupts the keying between the radio and the amplifier, which means if my SWR goes over uh, 1.5, preset or 2.0 to 1, this opens up and stays open until the problem goes away. So I can't burn up the amplifier, I don't think. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, 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 what is it? Um, Elecraft makes this a W2 watt meter, but they don't automatic reset. So, so even though it does the same functionality, once it trips, you have to manually reset it. That's why the Elecraft, you don't want that one. It's half the price. You want the LP100 or 100A. That's it, boys and girls. Anybody going to ask a question? Yep. <laughs>